the patriarchs, their livestock, the land. This is the audio-visual companion to the article posted at obriproject.info on the resources page. That is O-B-R-Y-P-R-O-J-E-K-T dot I-N-F-O. For those of you viewing this on my Jonathan McTemus YouTube channel, I invite you to visit my Obri Project BitChute channel. And for those of you viewing this on the BitChute channel, I would invite you to visit my YouTube Jonathan McTemus channel, which will soon be the Obri Project channel, or in addition to. Now the copyright. This document, or presentation, including any accompanying documents, Canone Growth Chart, Mitzram Growth Chart, and the written content of the accompanying maps, is the intellectual property of the author, Jonathan D. McTemus, including the Obrey Beta 3 font used herein. This intellectual property may only be used or reproduced in any way, in full or in part, through the express consent of the author. Notes to the viewer. 1. I will be quoting mainly from the King James Version, and in a few cases, Brenton Septuagint. This is not due to preference, but that Strong's, which I also do not endorse, is geared to the KJV translation, and Brenton's is the most widely used and understood Septuagint translation. When using a King James quote, I will say a KJV before or after. And when using Brenton's, I will say a Brenton's or Septuagint before or after. Point two, all so-called Hebrew quotes will be presented left to right and in my Obri Beta 3 font. This font is yet in a beta stage, but will suffice for now. All ad hoc Obri words will be presented with the strong H code next to it as a subtext. The Obri quotes will be character for character, from the BHS, or Biblia Hebraica Stuttgartensia, in the natural, with no Nakud, and translated myself. Blueletterbible.org is one of many Strong's softwares out there. I'm in no way supporting or associated with them. Just be sure to enter the H before the number. In addition, Q Bible's Hebrew Old Testament is very useful in acquainting a novice reader with basic proper nouns within the text. Point three, this document is very heavy in Obri proper nouns. Whenever one appears, it will be presented in the Obri Beta 3 font with the Strong's as a subtext, then followed by brackets with the best pronunciation possible based on a reasonable phonetic consistency. Within the pronunciation brackets, you'll notice a frequent squiggle used between consonants. This is to signal you to go from one consonant to another with the least amount of effort and to not apply any obligatory vowel sound. Simply a breath between M and TS will produce something akin to mitz, or a breath from P to L will likely produce a pell sound. Frequently, the leading consonant will dictate the sound of the simplest movement from it to the ending consonant, so don't overdo the phonetics. Just get from one to the other in a natural breath. True, it would have been easier for the reader, and especially the author, to simply insert the KJV word or well-known Hebrew pronunciation, but that's exactly what we must get past in order to fully understand what is being communicated in the text. For most beginners and casual students, this is the best way to begin breaking the Masoretic notions. For those who will be acquiring and utilizing the tools made available at obreproject.info, you will soon find the text becoming less and less confusing once you realize you, if you are an English speaker, are speaking a Shemitic language today. Introduction. The more I read the Bible, the more I come in contact with a world and people quite foreign to the ones I was taught from the earliest age. Someone who I regard as a friend one day challenged my paradigms with a simple statement. I don't believe the events described in the Bible took place in the Middle East. All you see are place names, but no definitive details that describe Palestine. I honestly paid little attention to such a claim. Seriously? 
How incredulous. The fact that these events occurred in and around Palestine, Egypt, Mesopotamia, and outlying areas is undisputed. Opposition is indefensible, maybe even absurd. The real problem was that I'd soon find out I couldn't easily dismiss it. This was about the time that I started having to take a serious look at the source language of what is called the Old Testament, the language apart from the Masora, I now call Obri. My pursuits were anything but geographical. However, I found I couldn't study a single subject without these geographical anomalies standing out ubiquitously. In the course of learning what Obri is, how it was once used and understood, its similarity to English, and the prolific misappropriation of translational decisions, I kept seeing innumerable facts challenging my paradigms about the setting, culture, and people of the Bible. I couldn't chart types of waters without seeing a vastly different landscape than I'd seen in the front of or back of nearly every Bible I'd ever had. I couldn't review prophetic passages without understanding there are necessary caveats to them which Palestine can't fulfill. I was blown away at all the lands and people's names who had been altogether changed, confused, and scattered throughout the concordances and lexicons. I realized that an average reader of any English Bible is at a hopeless disadvantage in understanding the subjects we will be focusing on at the Obri Project website. Most recently, I found I couldn't understand even the Exodus, Israel's time in Mitzrim, not Egypt, and even the days of the patriarchs, Abram, Isaac, and Jacob, or Abram, Yitzhak, and Jacob, without understanding who these people were, what they did as a lifestyle, and the specific and deliberate way the living God, Alim, had preserved the facts in his word, and how these facts do contradict the tenets of the big three Abrahamic religions. These facts inevitably pressed me towards what I now find myself presenting, a comprehensive set of various equations, spreadsheets, maps, and tables that I hope will contribute to a greater overall understanding of all who have eyes and ears. Without much more ado, let us begin the process of gathering information from Scripture and using it, along with as much as we can understand about livestock herding, the nature and cultures of people, and conditions we observe in Scripture and in our own day to test the Middle East and specifically Palestine for its locational candidacy. The importance of clarifying the land wherein these things took place can't be overstated. Furthermore, determining the people being spoken to ranks right up there alongside of it. Today, strife and death is enhanced as a way of life for the Arabs and Palestinians. They have lived perpetually in a land now claimed by the Jew. What if we could go back far enough? Would these people and places have very different names? Do you think that impossible? If so, keep in mind, I live in a place called America with an assumed indigenous people called Indians. Was this always so? Aren't Indians in India? Are you telling me an entire people type and continent's names and histories were altered right before our eyes? That most certainly seems to be the case. Now let's look at Abram. Addressing the initial scope, it must be established that when the Bible reads, and took Abram, Shri, his wife, and Lut, his brother's son, and all their acquisitions which he acquired, and the beings which he made in Haran, and proceeded to go to the area of Canon, and came to the area of Canon, Genesis 12, 5, KJV, the Bible is not including all the other people with him, handmaids, general servants, keepers of animals, men of action, etc. It seems that often, in our cursory readings of Genesis, we don't give a whole lot of attention to chapter 14, verse 14, which reads, And hearing, Abram, of the taking of his brother, then selected he spearmen 
born in his house, 8, 10, and 300, or 318, and he pursued unto Dan. And now that is the King James Version with a few alterations made by me, which you are about to see why. There are variations that say trained men, or trained soldiers, or servants, for the Hanikiyu. It only has this single appearance in this form, but you'll find its root to be Hanith, 2595, or spear. These were men of action, and they'd need to be, given what they were about to do. The preceding word, u Iraq, translated armed sometimes, but more often, draw out, emptied, or poured forth, ought to be translated here more consistently, as I did, selected. So then, he had 318 men to choose from, taking not all, but the most reliable and faithful, born in his house. Demographics are not difficult. They stay mostly the same wherever you go, unless there are aggravating factors, war, disease, infanticide, and euthanasia. If a population is allowed to go the natural way, they all stay very similar. Male-to-female ratio is often very close to 50-50, with female numbers usually tipping the scale slightly in their favor. You can check demographics of Texas, Togo, and Tehran and find besides annual growth rate, conditions remain remarkably similar when any population is allowed to grow unhindered. Age ranges in relation to entire populations are also quite ubiquitous. If I were to select all men, 20 and over, up to retirement age, 65, from various countries and American states, that average percentage of men in that age range is 27.82%. I'll round up to 28%. You'll find every figure herein is geared towards giving the Middle East the advantage. No cooking the numbers here, no close calls. I want the Middle East, and Palestine in particular, to have every advantage. Remember, the text doesn't even imply that these were all the men he had between 20 and 64. It says he selected of fighters or spearmen born in his house. We, by all rights, could reduce the percentage of them to the overall number of Abram's house, in many honest and biblical ways, and end up with a much larger starting figure, but we won't. I am conceding every advantage. The number we end up with for overall size of Abram's house is 1,135.7. There were 215 years in Canaan and 215 years in Mitzrim to account for. If you're under the impression that Yisrael were in Mitzrim, not Egypt, for 400 years, you're not paying attention to genealogies. Even the Septuagint concurs. Abram was told by Yahweh in Genesis 15, 13 from the KJV, quote, And he said unto Abram, Know for a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs, and shall serve them, and they shall afflict them four hundred years." Unquote. If anyone attempts to argue that they had to be in Mitzram four hundred years because of the they shall serve them, they shall afflict them part, remember, Yisrael had it very good until just before Masha, a.k.a. Moses, was born. Their affliction in hard bondage and infanticide was about 80 years. Yahweh was expressing much to Abram in one statement. No one would win a, quote, 400 years of hard bondage, unquote, debate based on biblical evidence. For all this time, and especially in Canaan, we will need to figure them for herders specifically. They would have to keep livestock as their main source of food and income. They were rarely able to stay in an area long enough for crops, and even when they are able to plant crops, they'd need to dedicate a good deal of grains to feeding their livestock while wintering, unless we figure them for year-round grazing. Either way, as you'll see, a defense of Palestine becomes quite unattainable. 
Now that we've established that we are not looking at a little ragtag band of Abram, Lut, and Cherie, before we draw out the years and consider the necessary charts, spreadsheets, maps, Bible verses, and aggravating versus mitigating factors, we need to establish what we are talking about. Defining the animals, people, demographics, and tabular data. We'll need to start by breaking a few stereotypes and educating ourselves on what we are looking at and the needs of various livestock and people. Let's begin by establishing facts. On your screen is a passage from Genesis 12:16 in Obrey with a limited amount of translation added to it. What we want to establish is the continually reoccurring terms for livestock, tzan and bakir. The other words present are important words, but for the purposes of this paper and for reasons of their dubious etymology, we aren't concentrating on them now. It will suffice to say that Obed and Shippe have enough cross-reference evidence to easily settle on male and female servants. But Hamar and Athne and Gamal will need to be left alone until another paper. On screen now is another passage in Obri from Genesis 13:2 with limited translation. The Kasap and Zeb, translated silver and gold, will be regarded for now as tertiary, like the other pack, draft, work, and saddle animals we may encounter. Again, these words are important, but will not have a weighted bearing on the words we need to understand. We will, however, establish makne. Makne, Strong's 4735, the broadest of these three. Related roots are kun, 7064, and kane, 7069. There are, in fact, many three-character roots utilizing kun. However, not all are appropriate as it would be flippant to refuse to recognize the existence of homonym, antonym, and synonym in Obri. A cross-reference check to these three reveals a similarity of root intent, and makne, by all accounts, is the broadest domestic farm and herd animal term. Tsan, Strong's 6629. Besides many other variations, mostly the appears-with kind, it's most often translated flock, sheep, or cattle. These are not synonyms. Based on the elemental ideograms tz, movement, a, uh, augmentation, un, suffix used as denoting less than, but characterized by. The u is frequently dropped when this suffix is a permanent attachment to another root. With the N alone, it still signifies division, less than, but similar. The Tsa root words have to do with movement. Tsan is then a descriptive of a thing or body characterized by movement. Grazing livestock. All evidence suggests it is both sheep and goat. It appears that Tsan encompasses many of the animal word entries such as She, Oz, Kashab, Rahal, etc. Bakr, Strong's 1241, occurs 182 times as listed by Strong's. Bakr, like Tsan, does not appear in the plural. Neither does livestock or cattle. Considering all verses in which it is used and the associated terms, par and shur, Plus the fact that both milk and butter are directly associated with it, cattle is the preferred translation. Cow will not be used due to the verses that directly cite both male or zikar and female or nukbe. The surety of this author as to bakir being cattle is 100%. Cattle are in the family bovidae and subfamily bovinae. These are man's terms. However, they all have a reason for being classified as they are. We need to now understand that what we are looking at is a community. A community needs to eat, needs shelter, needs protection, 
and what we will factor in will have to account for much while still giving Palestine every advantage. At this point, we really don't know the materials their tents and clothes were made of. Quite possibly cannabis. Canna. Canaan? But it is safe to assume that they would be utilizing wool, goat's hair, cow skin, all skins for leather, the milk of the three for milk cheeses, and the in the cow's case, butter. They were moving frequently and had not the advantage until Alni Mumre to grow anything. And the text doesn't say he does. Even at Bar Shabot, it only reads he planted a grove. Now, grove being a shell, Strong's 815, is unproven and highly dubious. That's at Genesis 21:23. It's not until Yitzhak at Genesis 26:12 that we know planting is being done. One must understand you cannot use the same ground for planting and grazing. Plus, they couldn't mine their precious metals, so we must assume their various grains, spices, smithing metals, iron, bronze, etc., were being bought with the produce of their flocks and herds, or tzan and baker. So, maybe over 1,000 with Abram weren't eating mostly a meat diet, which it sounds likely they were, meat and grains. But, even if not, they'd need to buy their grains, fruits, vegetables, and spices. So what would they buy them with? They'd use either livestock, produce of livestock, or precious metals, most likely acquired by selling their livestock. The people are of greatest importance here, and the animals are their food, clothing, and supplies. In order to figure the animals, they would need to keep we need to figure on the people's needs, then translate that to animals kept, and finally to AUs, AUMs, and the like. To figure the sustenance that one can get from a bovide animal, each kind needs to be considered in what it produces, on average, and the value this brings back to the individual, which can then be applied to a unit. These units will then be averaged as far as how many a human needs per annum or per year. This point is where some necessary tables come into play. We know Abram had a large company, and we know they were continually on the move. What comes more clear in textual examination is that they establish an alley, not unlike American cattle herders, north to south. So, even when they establish places to settle and work out from, they are still moving their livestock. On your screen is Table 1. I highly encourage everyone to view the documents that I posted on the research page of obriproject.info while watching or listening to this video. They are very helpful. Table 1 is based on natural averages. No special breeds, no modern technology. No considerations are made here for modern herding worldviews based solely on profit. These averages are for basics in every animal, common sense values to people. The term personal food unit or PFU will be used as a way to translate many products into their usefulness to one average person per day. PFUs will be better explained in the next table. Average lifespans are long in these animals, however, if they were culled far earlier based on the needs of the community, more would be bred to satisfy, which would put the numbers we'll ultimately see back up to the same basic amounts. Hide slash final products PFUs are a one-time value placed on the hide and products of the carcass. We kept that quite low as well. On your screen now is Table 2. Table 2 represents the three main livestock animals and the amount of weight of produce, depending, that it would take to feed the average adult based on a 2,000 calorie per day diet for one day. The wool and hide rows are based on the standard market price of those things in 2018 and the average cost to put 2,000 calories per day into an average adult. Given that much of this is costly in today's market, we will average between products to determine a cost of $10 per day to feed an average adult on 2,000 calories. 
Children of differing ages do eat less, sometimes, as do the elderly, but a grown man who works all day can consume twice to three times the calories of an infant without a second thought. The addition of PFUs instead of calories alone is to provide an expression of mostly non-consumable but valuable products the animal may have, i.e. hide or wool. The way in which the calculations were performed was based on calories per ounces of any given product and dividing that into the 2000 number, multiplying the quotient by portion weight and dividing that by 16 for ounces. So if there are 100 calories in 2 ounces of product, 100 goes into 2000 20 times, then 20 must be multiplied by the weight, 2 ounces, and the product must be divided by 16 ounces. So the equation is on screen and 2.5 would be the pounds of the product needed to satisfy a PFU or personal food unit in one day. Some of these numbers are averaged based on the multitude of cuts of meat in a given animal with varying fat content. Also, cheeses can fluctuate pretty wildly depending on the process, breed, additives, even just natural, aging, and so forth. All these figures are a median average, and all of them, like all other figures, are lending the advantage to the Palestine is the promised land or pipal argument. Now on your screen is Table 3. Table 3 illustrates what it will take per animal to feed the average adult for one year. To do this, we need to calculate a lifetime product for these individual animals based not on modern commercial concerns, but on their uses in a simple agrarian, non-fluctuating market situation. Given the lossy nature of dairy products like butter, cheeses, yogurts, etc., an average must be made to satisfy a logical PFU. The total amount of milk will be considered with half being assumed for products at a 50% loss, which is normally made up for in calories. Thus, the three quarters of expected lifetime milk production will be considered. For ease of further PFU calculations, all finals will be rounded. With the preceding tables presented, we will need to discuss some very important factors that blend this information with an understanding of cattle, sheep, and goat breeding, various extensive considerations of a livestock-centered community, and an understanding of the requirements for the livestock needed. The first thing to be noted is that although many of these animals are culled before reaching eight years, that age given is relatively arbitrary, as we'll see. The more important information is average breeding capabilities and cycles. Whether the herdsmen wish to cull most animals at a younger age or not, the fact is that a certain amount of these beasts must be kept at any given time to satisfy the community's needs, without exceeding them so much as to be a drain on the community, not to mention the land. This would happen if they needed to supply too much feed versus what they are taking back in animal product, uh, whether that food source be the sheer amounts of acreage of forage needed or dry grains, which most natural herdsmen would try keeping to a minimum for ruminants, or if too many men and materials were required to control the herds slash flocks. So a reasonable number must be established. I also need to stress now that various people could take all the information provided in the preceding tables and use it to apply all kinds of various formulas. One could argue that the sheep count would be up far, far higher than the cattle or goat for any particular reason, or the other way around, and on and on. Besides this author inviting all to put on their thinking caps and work these things out yourselves, I'm inviting all comers to thoughtfully take the work herein and show the fallacies of logic, if they exist, to which I will give sober consideration. What we will now determine is, based on necessary PFUs and caloric intake, 
the mean average of pounds of livestock needed for an individual, which can then be applied to overall population numbers. If we were to be so short-sighted as to say, a milk cow has a high enough PFU to provide for one person one year, this, of course, doesn't account for many factors, not the least of which is you'd need to spread the final products, like all the meat and hide, say you sold it, over the year, and then wonder where is the next year's PFUs going to come from. So we must also think of the effects of the animals culled on the remaining animal population. We do, after all, want them to breed. And incidentally, if anyone on the Palestine is the promised land side would like, I can just figure the non-siring males as meat with the occasional female once through with all her birthing. However, this would swell the numbers needed far above what they will already end up being. As I've said, and I will repeat ad nauseum, I am giving the land of Palestine every advantage. In order for every man, woman, and child to be provided for, and continue to be provided for, there needs to be a certain amount of animals exceeding, by a good margin, the culling being done. This amount which we will express per person and accounting for residual production, milks, cheeses, etc., will then be applied to the growth chart formula, respectively. We will also consider the fact that it's not just people and livestock, it's people, livestock, riding animals. Herds this size will not be kept on foot, and if the pipal people insist that the shepherds weren't mounted, then they can add more needed PFUs, more livestock, to satisfy the needs of far more shepherds and dogs, or whatever beings they must imagine are needed when we take away the most common, efficient, and age-old ways of herding large numbers. Pack, draft, and work animals, living accommodations, medicine, clothing, animal accessories, etc. I think the point is made. This all adds to PFUs and AUMs, which we will get to, as their cattle, not their gold and silver, were their stock and trade. People with sense enough to survive and thrive would and do regard precious metals as only valuable for trade in an established market economy. Cattle and flocks are worth their output no matter where you go or whom you ask. The cattle and flocks are Abram, Yitzhak, and Jokob's stock in trade. When all the respective breeding cycles and projected breeding lifetimes, respective siring, suckling times, averages of male to female ratios in relation to specifically meat animals and breeding animals, percentages of younger animals slaughtered, loss of volume in milks when processed, uh, loss of weight in butchering, and on and on, are all taken into account, and all these components are important. A modest number of 500 pounds of livestock animal must be present at all times to continue an even provision for every man, woman, and child, including all aforementioned aggravating and mitigating factors. In addition to the tables I have provided, there exists many sources of consideration of all of these components online and in periodicals and publications. For expedience sake, I have not included all of these complex calculations, but it is not beyond anyone's reach to prove these things themselves. I will, however, quickly show the thought process behind such a figure. If the average person requires 365 PFUs in a year, let's say they can live off of a cow's milk, cheese, or butter while it's giving suck for 150 days, then the other 215 days, they'll use all usable meat slash product, and I hope most of it is treated for preservation. On New Year's Day, they have to start this all over again. To do so, you'll need a cow that's reached a two to three year maturity, but that's a cow. If it's a steer, you'll need more. 
You'll need one cow at two to three years ready to go and one at one to two years for the next year and the calf that the mother is giving suck to at the time. Plus, you'll need the bull for siring. Now, how much weight is that? It's far much more than we are figuring, I promise. And this does not get easier or different with a sheep or goat. Their milk products are similar in caloric providence, and based on their respective weights and potential breeding production, you're right back up to the needed pounds, or AUs, at any given time. When considered in this way, or any logical way, it will again need to be conceded that I've given the land of Palestine the advantage by not going up even further on the AUs, or total pounds of ruminant based on PFUs required to be kept per person at any given time. Before we can get to the central table of this document, I do need to explain AUs, what they are, how they are figured, and the accompanying considerations. An AU is an animal unit. This is expressed as 1 AU equals 1,000 pounds of grazing animal. A stocking rate is expressed as how many animals or how many pounds based on percentage of body weight consumption of forage we put on an acre. The Foraging and Grazing Terminology Committee defines it as the relationship between the number of animals and the grazing management unit utilized over a specific time period. A utilization rate is how much forage one AU consumes per month, and the growth rate is how much forage in pounds an acre can produce per month. Keeping these terms in mind, we need to also take a quick look at growth rates. The growth rate of any population is typically expressed as a percentage and can be derived from a simple equation. The equation goes as such. Let's say we are looking at one year, which we will be showing these per year, but this equation can work on any time span. We take new population, subtract initial population. We divide that number by the initial population number. We multiply this by 100, and we divide that number by the number of years past. Or, as you can see on your screen, I am showing the equation used. So some might rightly say, how can anyone really know the growth rate of the company of people with the patriarchs? The answer to this is woven into a number of factors, and as much as I would love to make this section shorter and simpler and present the next table, it's impossible without confirming what growth rate I applied and why. Besides the selected men of action being 318 we saw earlier, we have every reason to apply a good and steady growth rate to Abram, Yitzhak, and Jacob the entire time they're in Canon. The following passages serve to illustrate this. I have listed them sequentially and by respective patriarch. So, Abram, Genesis 13.2, and Abram was very rich in cattle, in silver, and in gold. Genesis 13, 6. And the land was not able to bear them that they might dwell together, for their substance was great, so that they could not dwell together. Genesis 17, 2. And I will make my covenant between me and thee, and I will multiply thee exceedingly. And that was Yahweh speaking to Abram. Genesis 24, 1. And Abraham was old and well stricken in age, and Yahweh had blessed Abraham in all things. Genesis 24.35 And Yahweh had blessed my master greatly, and he has become great, and he hath given him flocks and herds and silver and gold, and men servants and maid servants and camels and asses. And that, of course, is Elozer speaking to Ribka's family. Now we move on to Yitzhak. Genesis 25, 11. And it came to pass after the death of Abraham that God blessed his son Yitzhak, and Yitzhak dwelt by the well Lahirei. Genesis 26, 12. 
Then Yitzhak sowed in the land and received in the same year an hundredfold, and Yahweh blessed him. Genesis 26.13 And the man, Yitzhak, waxed great and went forward and grew until he became very great. Genesis 26.14 For he, Yitzhak, had possession of flocks and possession of herds and a great store of servants and the Philistines, or Palshathim, envied him. Now, Jacob. Genesis 30.43 And the man, Jacob, increased exceedingly and had much cattle and maid servants and men servants and camels and asses. Genesis 31.9 Thus Alim hath taken away the makne, remember from earlier, makne, of your father, and given them to me. Genesis 32.5 And I have oxen and asses, flocks, and men servants and women servants, and I have sent to tell my Lord that I might find grace in thy sight. Uh, these next couple of verses are all passages of uh, Jacob speaking to Oshu, or Jacob to Esau. Genesis 32, 6, And the messengers returned to Jacob, saying, We came to thy brother Oshu, and he also comes to meet you, and four hundred men with him. Genesis 32, 7, Then Jacob was greatly afraid and distressed, and he divided the people that were with him, and the flocks, and herds, and camels, into two bands. Genesis 33, 9, And Oshu said, I have enough, my brother. Keep that thou hast unto thyself. Genesis 33, 11, Take, I pray thee, my blessing that is brought to thee, because Alayim hath dealt graciously with me, and because I have enough. And he urged him, and he took it. Genesis 36, 6. And Oshu took his wives, and his sons, and his daughters, and all the persons of his house, and his cattle, and his beasts, and all his substance which he had got in the land of Canon, and went into the country from the face of his brother Jacob. Genesis 36, 7. For their riches were more than that they might dwell together, and the land wherein they were strangers could not bear them because of their cattle. And that's all from the KJV. I do want to make a quick note before I move on. You'll notice that quite frequently, many of the terms that I was expressing in these verses as they are translated from the KJV, um, they are not consistent, I'm afraid, and I am sorry for that. Unfortunately, it would have gotten even more confusing if I were to have corrected all of them, like I did in Genesis 31.9 when I corrected cattle to makne. Uh, one thing in addition I have found during the course of researching and writing this paper that for one thing the term gamal, which is always translated as camel, might very well not be so. And I will be doing and presenting some work on that in the future. Now continuing. When we read a passage like Genesis thirty forty three, we should always keep in mind that whenever the Bible says whomever increased greatly, whether with or without those specifics, so I'm talking about all those cattle or makne, rakush, which is basically all living things or all non-living things, cattle, men servants, maid servants, all of those specifics, with or without that. You can count on them being there. So if it says the man increased greatly, you can count on the fact that they are there. And there isn't any gross speculation here either. Oshu is coming to meet his brother Jacob with 400 men in Genesis 32, 6. Their father is still alive and therefore hasn't given them their inheritance. Yet, Oshu alone has 400 men of action with him. In the preceding verses, Jacob divides his various herds into groups of distinct animals and sends them ahead separately. This alone would take many men to accomplish but he also has much more substance left. You must take into consideration 
the large gift he gives to Oshu could not exceed his company's needs or he would have big problems until they caught back up. Be assured that the population of the people with the patriarchs was great and we can expect nothing but a good birth rate to match so that we can comprehend what a reasonable birth rate looks like I've consulted many demographic sources quoting worldatlas.com from their article countries with the highest population growth it reads where the African nations of South Sudan and Niger experienced a growth rate of 4.09 and 4.00 respectively, unquote, and, quote, Oman has experienced a growth rate of 8.45% in recent years, unquote. It can and should be concluded that countries with the more natural environments today are often experiencing a growth rate of between 4.0% and 8.45%. Also, these figures often have included fluctuations in and out due to migration, which will always be the case. However, later we'll take a look at the official world population growth rate, and you'll find that the numbers applied here are right on. Currently, white Western countries are experiencing far lower growth rates due to so many internal and external factors by design that it is its own separate and grievous subject. According to CountryMeters.info, the current live population of Oman is at 5,850,779. Based on their proven growth rate, we can take the percentage, turn it into a decimal, and figure at current rates, next year it will be at 6,345,170. This sort of simple application of percentage growth rate to a population will allow our projection of total population during the years in Canon to be accurate. And here's the key to its accuracy. Common demographics. Like before, when we applied an understanding of common demographics to our knowledge of Abram having 318 selected men of action and extrapolating the conservative overall number of 1,135.7, we will perform a comparison between the 215 years in Canon and the 215 years in Mitzram. And yes, it's only 215 years in Mitzram, and no, Mitzram is not, nor ever was, Egypt. I understand. We've all been taught 400 years and in Egypt. Both factors are absolutely wrong. This isn't a paper about Mitzram and Canon per se, but besides the Bible, attesting to the fact that the slavery and persecution of Yisrael, not the Jews, only began a bit before Masha, a.k.a. Moses' birth and the exodus commencing when he was 80. If you'll check Genesis 46.11 and 1 Chronicles 6.1, you'll see that the 400 years in Mitzrim would only be feasible if each of the only two generations from Louis, a.k.a. Levi, his son, Kahath, to Moshe, would need to vastly outlive their fathers and sons, but also sire children at an age far older than Abram. But don't believe me, believe the Bible. It's right in there. Now, according to the BHS, Leningrad Codex, or just Masoretic, Yisrael, that is the genetic seed of Jacob, was 70 men, or 70 males, going into Mitzram. Genesis 46, 27, and Exodus 1, 5 records this. According to the Brenton English translation of the Septuagint, there were 75. This isn't an age range demographic, but specifically the males of the house of Jacob. Upon leaving, Mitzrim, 
Exodus 12:37, we read, quote, about 600,000 men on foot from the KJV. The numbering system of Exodus will now be quickly and biblically established. So Numbers 1-3, from 20 years old and upward, all that are able to go forth to war in Israel, thou and Aaron shall number them by their armies, KJV. This is straightforward. There's no ambiguity within the text to argue. And we will see this sort of numbering scheme throughout Scripture, unless explicitly stated otherwise, like in Genesis 46, 26, quote, All the souls that came with Jacob into, not Egypt, but Mitzrim, which came out of his loins, besides Jacob's sons' wives, all the souls were threescore and six, from the KJV. That means old and crusty to young and pink, all the males of the house of Jacob. Most numbering in the Bible is 20 years and up to the age when a man couldn't walk and fight well. Incidentally, unless specifically included and noted, Louis numbers, Levi, Louis, his numbers aren't recorded, as they weren't to be warring and doing common work. So you can figure another hefty percent ought to be added onto these population numbers. But again, Palestine and the Middle East will get every advantage. Demographically, the percentage of men from 20 to 65 in virtually every natural population, as shown earlier, is about 28%. At that common demographic percentage of total population, we can figure the total at about 2,142,857, or just over 2 million, since the biblical quote is, quote, about 600,000 men on foot, excluding Levi. People of the direct genetic lineage of Jacob Yishrael. Earlier, when the total males is given, we can take the high number of 75 and add over 50% for wives and daughters, giving the Mideast the advantage, and start at year one in Mitzram with a population of 160. Again, this is just direct family, genetic family. No mention of all the people with them, which were not direct family, coming into or going out of Mitzram. To reach just over 2 million in the allotted 215 years, a growth rate of 4.5% annually was applied. Now Table 4, which is on screen. It is the Mitzram growth chart. This shows the growth rate over the 215 years at 4.5% annually. Remember, the Levites, we could easily argue that it ought to be higher than 4.5%, but we won't. And how is it that Yishrael grew nicely while Mitzram did not? That's the subject of another paper, but the answer is in Genesis 47. Suffice to say that it is a fair, even low, growth rate. This same growth rate due to all the verses supplied about the patriarch's growth and blessings, would be entirely fair. But, of course, we want Palestine to have the upper hand. So in Table 5, I've applied only a 3% growth rate per annum. Before I move forward, I do want to take a moment to make sure that you thoroughly understand um, how these spreadsheets were programmed into Lieber Office Calc and how these figures were ultimately derived. Uh, I think that's very important. Now, yes, the PDF versions of these spreadsheets, just for uh, a visual aid, were provided along with the main document at the website on the resources page. But I think it would be helpful at this point to have a screenshot of LibreOffice Calc with Mitzram Growth Chart opened so you can understand what I did. And this is all uh, very basic. In column A, I applied one year. In column B, it is Yisrael's total population. 
uh, which we started out with 160, as I explained earlier. In column C, what we had to do with our first cell here is to punch in the equation of cell B2 times 0 0.045, which is that 4.5% growth rate. It gave us the number 7.2. Now in column D, we had to also put in the equation of cell B2 plus cell C2, which wound us up with the new number, which would be the end day of the year, the population would be at 167.2. Now, starting in the uh, next row of cells, uh, cell B3, I guess it would be, all I did here was punch in equals D2. So every time we have that end of the year number, it's going to automatically be applied to B. Once we've done that, and put our calculations back into row C and row D, then we can select all of these columns and pull them down to where we get to uh, whichever year we want to. And in both cases, we go down to year 215. And in the case of Mitzram, when we're talking about the total population of uh, Israel, which would be uh, male and female based on the demographic math that I did earlier, we would get a population of right around 2,061,210. Uh, now, with that all laid out before us, and before we look at Table 5, we must revisit the science of animal units, forage growth, and grazing. Penning up ruminants and feeding them nothing but grains is not a traditional nor a healthy practice. It's one of greed or absolute necessity. The patriarchs grazed their livestock, unlike the livestock industry today, owned by Jews in Palestine, which relies on imported feeds and constantly caged animals. To stop there would be very fair but would not give Palestine the advantage. So let's assume Palestine for the same kind of growth rate for, say, the American Southeast. I don't know how familiar all readers are with the American Southeast, but it is a good, rich land with many areas relatively near the Gulf and enjoying year-round grazing. Most countries that have shepherds have some equivalence to the U.S.'s NRCS, or National Resources Conservation Service. What they do is provide reports for areas of land, their forage growth rates, and what species of forage. The NRCS produces resources that explain how one may determine forage rates for themselves. Going by all average forage rates for a good, productive land like the American Southeast, a year-round average of acres per month, which is how many pounds of good forage will grow on an acre in a month, is 1,000 pounds. And again, this is being slightly liberal. The average was actually a little bit less. Plus, the herder will need to make adjustments per the season due to heavy fluctuation, but this is just an average. The NRCS advises, as does everyone expert in grazing, supply rates and the real dangers of overgrazing, that 50% of the land's forage rate be used and then letting it grow back. A ruminant in general will consume 3 to 4% of its body weight per day in forage, and the simplest equation for its consumption for a month is body weight times 1.2 pounds. If an AU is 1,000 pounds, we can figure an AU for eating 1,200 pounds forage per month. This will require two acres at the average forage growth rate per AU, which remember is 1,000 pounds of ruminant animal per month. Now it's quite true that many good areas of growth can produce 2,000 plus pounds of forage in the middle of summer. 
However, this does swing hard in the winter, even in more tropical areas. And the more tropical an area, like say the eastern Mediterranean, the more concerns there are about heat stress on the ruminants. An average Texas rancher, for example, will figure a 1,000 steer or 1 AU for 20 acres for the year plus supplements. The patriarchs clearly did not overgraze, as they remained in the same areas throughout their initial time in Canaan. From the movements described by them in the Bible, they were conscious about keeping their ruminants on good forage land for the appropriate time. Now, view table 5, the Canone growth chart. On screen, I have the Canone growth chart. It is actually quite similar, the way it's laid out, uh, the numbers, to the Mitzram growth chart, but I do want to go through it very quickly. It starts in column A with 5 years. This is an average given of about the time that Abram would have had to have gone and saved his nephew Lut. We're saying about five years time in. Now starting with that number actually does again give Palestine and the Middle East the advantage. In column B, cell 2, we start with that number that we figured based on average demographics, which would be 1135.7. In column C, we, uh, we put in the equation for cell B2 times the 3% growth rate. So it would be multiplied by 0.03. Column D, cell 2, you get the, uh, the result of that equation. I did the same thing with the third cell of column B as far as equals D2 and once we punch that in and get the uh, equations in for the next two cells this will all um, this will work like most Excel or calc programs where we'll be able to just pull everything down to our 215 years column E is the amount of livestock pounds per person. So we take cell D2 and we multiply that by 500. Column F, we take cell E2 and divide that by 1000 and that gives us our animal units. And once we have that number, then we can go to column G and we can take cell F2 and divide that by 320 since the actual amount of acres in a square mile is 640. But as I've already established, we're going to need to graze an AU on two acres at that average forage rate, which again is a really outstanding, awesome, unbelievable, and I would say fantasy forage growth rate for Palestine and the Middle East. And we end up with our square miles number. That is the square miles of grazing land that they would need per month. So when we pull this all the way down to 215 years, here we find ourselves at 907.3 square miles. Now continuing from the document. The percentage growth rate is 1.5% lower than their time in Mitzram. The pounds of livestock needed were carefully calculated with earlier tables, as you saw. The pounds of livestock is then reduced to AUs, and in the last column, the amount of acreage needed per month is represented in square miles, as I just explained. Note that the end number of square miles needed after 215 years in Canone is 907.3 square miles, and that's for one month. I've taken the liberty of also providing maps of Palestine and Egypt and applying circles of the appropriate square miles. I've also shown that same amount in a country like America. At this point, I am going to stop reading from the document and scroll through the attached PDF of these various maps 
with the square mile circles applied to them and the brief description so that you can see exactly how this looks. All right, so you can see map one showing Palestine with a circle of 862.72 square miles centered at Alia al Quds, basically the city claimed to be Jerusalem. And if you look, it is the yellow circle in the center. Uh, take note that in all of these maps, the square mile circles that I'm drawing are in all cases, pretty much, unless otherwise noted, smaller than the amount of square miles they would need after, or at the end of their 215 years in Canone, which is the 907 Point three square miles. Map number two showing Upper Egypt, the Nile Delta, with a circle of 897.57 square miles. It is centered as eastward as possible within the greenest land. This basic area would be where Goshen would need to most likely be located. Although some desperate geographical apologists say that Goshen was within a now defunct eastern distributary of the Nile. Of course, one problem is that the circle on the map is only illustrating the growth rate of the company of peoples with the patriarchs after 215 years in Canaan or Canaan not their booming growth rate during the next 215 years in Mitzram. Map number three is showing Europe with a circle of 838.39 square miles centered almost directly north of Burgundy in Le de France. Now map four and five is showing California and the western U.S. seacoast, with a circle of 889.29 square miles on the first map and 937.76 square miles on the second map. Both circles were casually placed near Monterey Bay to show them close to the approximate center of the state. And again, with this second much wider shot, that circle I've drawn on there is an additional 30 miles larger than our determined end square mile needs uh, in the growth chart for Canone. Map 6 is showing most of the United States with a circle of 909.78 square miles in the upper western Texas panhandle. Map number seven showing half the calculated required square miles at the end of the 215 years in Canaan or Canaan. The circle was placed between Elia slash Al Quds, the assumed location of Jerusalem, and Beersheba, which I usually call Barshabo, and this is also assumed. Of course, what the map doesn't show is how impossible the terrain between these two locations would be for grazing these herds. And once again, take another look at that uh, circle, knowing that it is half of the total calculated square miles after 215 years in Canon. Now map number eight, it is showing 857.65 square miles centered directly at what's called Beersheba, where the patriarchs would have spent the greater part of their 215 years in Canon. The impossibility of large, healthy herds of cattle and sheep slash goats here cannot be understated. Now back to the document. You need to stay with this train of thought and sound reason so to help you understand the reality of these kinds of numbers and their probability, especially when you have so many people to perform all the tasks of herding, caretaking, culling, building, etc. I'll note the largest private ranch in America. This is, of course, now that the unlawful acquisition 
of so much land by the federal government has restricted what was once free-range grazing land. The squeeze that these evil practices of the Fed, in conjunction often with UNESCO, have put on is what makes it necessary for places like the King Ranch and most herdsmen to have one place to graze all their cattle. Located outside Kingsville, Texas, near Corpus Christi, the King Ranch sits on 825,000 acres. That is 1,289 square miles of one location grazing. I know that even pointing this out and alerting the reader to the fact that there are many other enormous ranches like this one in the U.S., it may not stop a degree of immediate cognitive dissonance. The Wagner Ranch, for instance, boasts over 8 million pounds of just cattle and horses and over 800 continuous square miles of land. You might also remember that Yahweh is building a nation from the seed of Abram. And the amount of non-Israelite peoples that came out with them from Mitzram would be staggering. These would have been the non-Yishraeli peoples, many of whom had been with them from the start. Others would even become part of a tribe, like Caleb, son of Jephthuna, the Kenazite, which is a pretty unacceptable translation, Kenazite, but I digress. The models we've been programmed with must be abandoned if we are to see what the Bible is in fact telling us. Now, adding it up and considering all perspectives. There will most certainly be radical naysayers right out of the gate. I expect that. Remember, that model that's been ingrained in our minds is there deliberately. I would recommend, for starters, that everyone read Ashraf Izat's Egypt Knew No Pharaohs Nor Israelites to begin gaining an idea of how it could be that the lands we've been conditioned to believe are the promised land and surrounding areas cannot be. I also don't expect this paper to be the only source utilized for rethinking it all, but my hopes are it will be a positive building block in the ultimate case to prove not only where the events of the Bible transpired, but also who the Israelites were and are. Incidentally, Dr. Iza and I presently have come to different conclusions on the actual locale of Bible events. However, that may someday change. We are, though, in total agreement on the reality that the events described in the Bible could not possibly have taken place where most people currently believe they did. Many can also point out how a land can dictate the growth of a herd based on available forage, water, weather, etc. But as I've stated, we are given no indication that these things were limiting factors. Lut and Abram had to separate, that's true. But that the, quote, land was unable to bear them, from Genesis 13.6 KJV, is not to imply that there was any defect to the land. Note, that in the next verse, we read that the Kanoni and Perazi were in the land also. My response to that information is to take it as, besides the issues they are already dealing with, the conflicts of their herdsmen, those other peoples were in close proximity to them as well. The terrain, not forage supply rate, is also a likely issue, as anyone can study the area between Bethal and Oi and see that they would be on the slopes of at least one mountain, which is not highly advantageous for grazing. The exact reason for going back there, if any exists other than Abram having built an altar there, is not known. For any who would persistently argue that, although it's true, there must have been a thousand or so people on the move and therefore living off the produce of their livestock or selling it and consuming various other foods procured from the sale or trade. 
there's no hard evidence that they grew in any way you're presenting it. My answer would be, I've already shown verses stating that every patriarch, including the twelve, were continually growing in size and wealth. But yes, there is much more to prove such a growth rate. Here's a few examples. Now, we know that Shereh dies in Hebron. Shereh being translated Sarah. She dies in Hebron in Genesis 23, 1 and 2. About this time, Abram is staying at Barshbo, or at least not at Hebron. In verse 4, he asks to purchase the cavern of Mechpelah from Ahathi, so he may bury her, quote, out of his sight, unquote. In just three years, Yitzhak is dwelling at bar lhi Ray, while Abram is elsewhere. In Genesis 35, Jacob journeys from Shechem, where he had bought land, after he built a house and stables elsewhere, which is Sukkoth. Deborah, Ribka's nurse, dies at Bethel, and she's buried there. Later in 35, we see Yitzhak dwelling near Habrun in his old age. Later, Jacob is dwelling near Habrun. Thinking his sons to be grazing in Shechem, he sends Yusuf, a.k.a. Joseph, but he finds they are grazing in a place called Dothan. So what does this all mean? It shows a clear progression of land acquisition and greater division by the patriarchs, attempting to keep their ever-increasing number of people and livestock spread out enough to accommodate them all. In addition, the one thing that I think it also shows is the fact that when certain members of this company are at a retirement age, like in the case of Shireh, she's in Hebron when she dies. Um, Ribka's nurse is in Beth Al. Uh, there are a lot of clues to show us that they are constantly spreading out because, in part, due to their growth. Point number two. In Genesis 26, it is said that the Palshathim, not the Philistines, the Palshathim envied Yitzhak. Abram, Yitzhak, and Jacob all dwelt at many times near other people. It's clear those peoples were often not overly friendly towards them, but not once did any try killing them and taking what was theirs, which was envied by others. Why? They were a formidable company of people amidst these Kanoni. And what of the incidents where both Abram and Yitzhak tell their wives to say, He is my brother, to the Mitzri or the Pulshathi? In the case of the Mitzri, Shari is taken by Paro, a title of their king. In the case of the Pulshathi, she is taken by Abimelech, a title of their king. They are noticed by the kings of these two countries. A small band will not attract the attention of a king. We don't know what customs these two nations had that dictated their actions, which were obviously common knowledge to Abram, but it's reasonable to think Abram feared they would kill him subtly, perhaps poisoning or assassin. They were in the territory of those kings, those people. All they need do is kill them and take what is theirs. So why didn't they? Not out of ethics. And who says it's unethical amongst nations to defeat an invader and take what is theirs? No, I think what we're looking at is a very large company of people. And these were very broad places. Incidentally, there was no shortage of other peoples living in and around Canaan, all of these peoples being strangers to the patriarchs. They were all a potential threat. So how many various peoples were there in the land of Canaan? Well, I've provided a list that I do not know whether or not it is 
uh, completely exhaustive or not, but these are definitely people that lived in and around Canon. We will start with the Kini, Strong's 7017, translated Kenite. These are descendants of Cain. And yes, this is many centuries after Noah's flood. The next is the Kenazi, Strong's 7074, translated Kenazite or Kenazite with two Zs. No lineage is given. There's the Kadmoni. Strong 6935, translated Cadmonites, no lineage is given. It's the same as Strong 6931. It is, in fact, an ancient tribe or tribes, and I think any serious researcher could probably find a real gold mine by looking into the Cadmoni. Then there's the Hathi. Strong's 2850, translated Hittite. This is the second son of Canon. No proof of relationship to the Turkish Hittite. There's the Perizzi, or translated Perizzite. No lineage is given, possibly related to Strong's 6518 through 21. The Rapim, translated Giants, Strong's 7497, translated Giants or Raphaim, no lineage given, possibly related to Strong's 7495 as the root and 7496. That's another one of those little gold mines for somebody who wants to dig in. The Amory, Strong's 567, translated Amorite, son or tribe from Canon, listed fourth of descendants. Now the Kenani, Strong's 3669, translated Canaanite, Ham's fourth son or resident of Canon. This usage is kind of a broad spectrum. There's the Girgashi, Strong's 1622, translated Girgashite or Girgasite, son or tribe from Canon, listed fifth of descendants. The Yabusi, Strong's 2983, translated Jebusite, son or tribe from Canon, listed third of descendants. The Palshathim, translated Philistine, defined as a people from Kaftor or Crete, but this is a baseless claim. The Tzidanim, Strong's 6722, translated Sidonian, first born of Canon, occupied a very large area. The Omlaki, Strong's 6003, translated Amalekite. This is not the son of Oshu and no lineage given. This is an old nation. See numbers 24. The Girgashi, Strong's 1651, translated Geshuri or Gesherites. No lineage given, old nation near Canon. The Gazri, Strong's 1511, translated Gezrites. No lineage given. Not the same as 1507. It is an old nation. The Zuzim, Strong's 2104, translated Zuzim. No lineage given. Some lived in a place called M, Strong's 1990. Unfortunately, it is often translated as Ham for no good logical reason. There is the Amim, Strong's 368, translated Amims. No lineage given called Rapa, like the Onakim, which are both translated as giants. Now, there is the Onakim, Strong's 6062, translated Anakims, no lineage given, said to be Ram, Strong 7311. This is a descriptive word, Ram, lofty, great, and broad. There is the Hari, uh, translated Horite, Strong's 2752, no lineage given, called Cave Dwellers. However, Har, Strong's 2715, is usually translated as Nobles. The Hui, Strong's 2340, translated Hivite, a son or tribe from Canon, listed six of descendants, sixth of descendants. Uh, the Sini, Strong's 5513, translated Sinite. Son or tribe from Canon, listed eighth of descendants, probably related to Strong's 5512, 5514, and 5515. 
the Hamathi, Strong's 2577, translated Hamathite, son or tribe from Canaan, listed 11 of descendants from Strong's 27 or 2574, probably also related to 2575 and 76. And the Tsuri, Strong's 67, 6876, translated Tyrian, no lineage given. Close nation and city in Naphtali, related at least to Strong's 6865. I am sure I'm forgetting a few. All these people were formidable. All were strangers to the patriarchs. All could have just taken what was theirs, the patriarchs, and killed all the men, and no Canoni would have batted an eye at it. Maybe we can just trust that since only five years in the land, Abram had enough fighting men to take on the four kings of Genesis 14.1, who were beating everyone else they came against, that as they grew and grew, and there's ample textual proof that they did just that, that all the surrounding peoples would not be too quick to attack them. Aha! But what about Genesis 34.30? Quote, And Jacob said to Simeon and Levi, You have troubled me to make me to stink among the inhabitants of the land, among the Canaanites and the Perizzites, and I being few in number, they shall gather themselves together against me and slay me, and I shall be destroyed, I and my house. That's from the KJV. Yes, Jacob does say, I being few in number. But if he was so few in number, why would these peoples have to gather themselves together against him? And does anyone think Levi and Simeon killed all those men by themselves? Remember, the Bible is talking about a certain family of people. Most times, all the other people with them will not be mentioned. Also, Jacob, Jacob had not yet come into his inheritance. Point three, according to Wikipedia and various other mainstream census and demographics entities, the world's population was 1 billion in 1804 and 7.6 billion as of May 1st, 2018. If we plug the numbers into our population growth rate equation from above, that number turns out to be at an average 3% growth rate. And even though the Yisraeli or Israelites enjoyed a far higher growth rate during their 215 years in Mitzrim, in the spirit of giving Palestine every advantage, well, actually, it's the Pipal people that are getting the advantage. I've got a feeling that Palestine, Egypt, and every land and people remotely near the state of Israel would forfeit all these advantages for a little freedom from terror. But we use the same 3% growth rate on the Table 5 spreadsheet, Canone Growth Chart. Keep in mind, in the last 215 years of world history, there have been many of the aforementioned aggregating factors to quell the population which were not present in the patriarch's camp. So, how much fooling around against common averages and multiple verses telling us plainly that they were growing and increasing abundantly does anyone expect we do to make a land that cannot fit this narrative fit? Now, look at the map on screen of Egypt and Palestine. Now read with me Exodus 3.8. This is Yahweh speaking. And I am come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Mitzri, not Egyptians, and to bring them up out of that land unto a good land and a large, unto a land flowing with milk and honey, unto the place of the 
Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites. The Obri for, quote, a good land and a large, unquote, is Tube, Strong's 2896, and Rehabe, Strong's 7342, or Goodly and Wide. There is a comparison being drawn here from the land they are in, which we are all told is Egypt, to the land where they are going, which we are all told is Palestine. Look back at the map of Egypt and Palestine. Maybe Yahweh was confused. In conclusion, the preceding information was based mainly on an angle of demographics and livestock management. The very same book of Genesis can be and should be examined from a geographical, topographical, economical, cultural, linguistic, zoological, anthropological, and of course a theological slash spiritual angle, or at least these angles for starters. Most self-professed Christians have a very superficial and myopic approach to Bible study. The me-me-me approach will never search out the deliberate age-old secrets stored in Scripture. The days of the simple Simon criticizing those who go deep as being Gnostic, as if to know should ever be a pejorative, must come to an end. Our world is slipping into a very dark time. I place a great deal of blame on the feel-good daily devotional Christian. Whomever convinced us that the more ignorant we become, the more righteousness we've attained, was not teaching from the Bible. The one who does teach, my people perish for a lack of knowledge, is a true shepherd Indeed, we all must end our phobias concerning examination of the Bible and the world around us. We must consider many perspectives and peruse dissenting arguments. All of us have work to do in the days ahead. I've examined the patriarchs as I see them truly described. At this point, I still feel that I'm lacking. The richness of the text throughout Genesis alone is enough to gain untold wealth in wisdom and knowledge. There are still a myriad of answers to historical questions waiting in the pages of Scripture. Someone has decided to present the Bible to us as a dead book. This is, of course, by design and will not last. I invite all to examine my research for its strengths and flaws and to join the few of us laboring at understanding in some way. The layers of distortion and deception aimed at our understanding of the Bible go deep, very deep, and span centuries. Concerning my conclusions stated above, the fact is, there are many elements one can point out, even without doing an Obrey word study, that illustrate plainly that the land of the Bible is not and never was the land of Palestine, Egypt, or the Middle East. This is precisely what we at the Obrey Project will demonstrate. The Bible is a book written to a different people than today's Jews, focusing on a different land than today's Palestine, Egypt, and the Middle East with an obviously different eschatology. And what's the positive side of this revelation? Who are the people? What is the land? And what does it all mean? It will all be revealed in time. Once again, to read this document and the accompanying documents, please visit 
obryproject.info. That's O-B-R-Y-P-R-O-J-E-K-T dot info on the resources page. There are a number of additional links at the end of the main article document for your continued research and edification. So until next time, I am John Mactimus for the Obrey Project, and we will speak again.